Welcome to What Lecture Online. In the previous video, we saw how the team helping Mickelson try to figure out the speed of light had gone through this elaborate scheme, this elaborate method with enormous amount of effort to try and determine the distance precisely between the, the source of the light on top of Mount Wilson to the reflector and of course multiply times two to get back. And they were within about 10 centimeters of the actual distance at least so they thought when they actually measured that. So they were very very accurate. Now the second part of the equation was how much time did light take to go from here to there and back because after all if you're trying to find the speed of light you take the distance that it travels and divide it by the time that it took to get there. So now the next big hurdle was to figure out how long that took. And that was of course again not an easy feat unless you come up with some brilliant method and Mickelson who had built an interferometer figured out an incredible way to measure the time that it took for the light to go from Mount Wilson to Mount Baldy and back to Mount Wilson. So, how did they do that? Well, they had a rotating object to which they attached eight mirrors. And so the angle between each mirror was exactly 45 degrees. So 45 times 4, that's 90, that's 180, times 2, that's 360. So of course that makes one complete circle. So each mirror was angled at an angle 45 degrees from the next mirror. So let's say that you did not keep this moving. Well, what would happen is you have a light source that would reflect light off this mirror. That light would then reflect to the reflector on Mount, on Mount Baldy or Mount San Antonio. Then the light would come back over here, reflect off this mirror, and then some observer would then actually see the light. But of course, if it wasn't moving and the mirrors were just perfectly aligned, you would see a continual light beam and you could no way, there would be no way to figure out how long it took for the light to take that trip. But now what happens is you make it rotate. So what happens is, first when you rotate it slowly, you see that this mirror would slowly start moving in that direction. So the light would bounce off this mirror and it would then hit the reflector. Then it would come back, hit off this mirror, and if the rotation wasn't fast enough, the reflection would be at an angle like this. And so the observer could not see something, wouldn't see any light. And then what happens is you keep speeding up the rotation in such a way that the light reflector would then, from an angle like this, begin to rotate to an angle like this. And then at some point, if the rotation is just fast enough so that the whole wheel would rotate through one eighth of a turn in the, in the time that it takes light to go from here to there and back, then the light would go like this, hit off this mirror, reflect off the reflector, come back this way, and by the time the light gets back, this mirror would have moved into this position just perfectly if the speed was just right so that the light would reflect straight to the observer. To slow, the light would go like this. If it moved too fast, the light would go like this. So you change, you keep changing the speed of that wheel until you get it just right that the person would see the light coming from there at just the right speed. Okay, once you have determined that, what you need to do then is you need to figure out how long that took, the time for one eight of, of revolution for the next mirror to be just in the right place to see the reflected light. So it turns out when they measured it and what they probably had was they had a counter on that wheel and they let it go for a very long time as long as they kept seeing the light they would just simply count it and measure over a long period of time to get a very accurate timing for a single one eight of a turn. So with the counter, they would then come to the point where they would measure just slightly over 529 revolutions per second. So then you want to have the period, and the period is the inverse of the frequency, the number of revolutions per second. So if you take the inverse of this number, you end up with this number right here. The period for one complete revolution was 1.89 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. But then, of course, we're not looking for a single resolution. We're looking for one eight of a res revolution. So now you have to take this number and divide it by eight to get this number. That is the time it took for the wheel to turn to one eight of a complete revolution, which was also the time that it took the light to go from here to Monbaldi and back. So what you do then is you take the distance, 35,420 meters, which is 35.42 kilometers. You divide it by the time that it took to take one eighth of a turn on the wheel and you came out, well not you, but they, they came out with a speed of 299,796 kilometers per second. 
Now, of course, with our modern technology, we've determined that it's actually 299,792.458 kilometers per second, if you want to really accurately. But notice the last digit, instead of a 6, it's actually a 2, or a little bit more than 2. They were actually off by only 0.001%. They determined the speed of light back in 1927, due to the work that Mickelson did at age 73, they came up with a number where they were only off by 0.001%. Imagine the work that went into measuring this distance accurately and imagine the genius to come up with this, this concept to measure that time very, very accurately. So through a Herculean effort using the United States Coast and Geodesic Survey and the brilliance of Mickelson to come up with this method, married together, they came up with something that was absolutely phenomenal a very, very accurate measurement of the speed of light. You must hand it to them. They really did a fantastic job. I guess that angle doesn't matter. The angle on the, um, the purple, purple line. Okay. So, ah, does this angle matter? Well, this angle is, of course, greatly exaggerated. You're talking about a distance of 35 kilometers, 22 miles, and a distance here of just a few inches. So the angle is non-existent, so, so to how speak. How big was that? How big was, the, how big was the rotating wheel? It was probably about only about this big. It's very small. A meter? Less than um, far less than a meter, yeah. So the, this angle is inconsequential. Why did they just do it on flat ground? Why did they have to go to a mountaintop? Why can't they do this? So why did they go through all that trouble <laughs> to do it across a very rugged mountainside? Well, yeah, it, it turns out, if you go to the desert and you're 22 miles away, the curvature of the Earth will prevent you from seeing that unless you build structures. Yeah, it would be easier if we just build some structures up higher. And then, you also have the problem with the refraction of light because of the density of the atmosphere. You're probably better off being up high in a mountain and have this direct line of sight so that you can build that measurement and do it like that. They must have figured that being up in the mountains was a far superior method than being somewhere in the desert and having to deal with the curves of the earth and any sort of other interference that might get in there. You always want to keep that direct line of sight of that 22 miles. And so there they had that point right there in the mountain they couldn't miss. Couldn't they just use triangulation to measure the distance? One big triangle and there's all these little triangles? <laughs> Why did they do one big triangle? Because they need to make this measurement and 50 meters. So you want to make a steel tape that's exactly 22 miles long? No, but um, <laughs> can you kind of know what that distance is? On a flat mountain, you find mountains where you can easier measure that. And... Notice the error. I guess I don't have the error on there anymore, but remember, eight okay. centimeters, eight centimeters of error. No, no, I mean the measurement error oh. was only this much, over yeah, 35 it. kilometers. Three. Guess how they figured out the height of Mount Everest? Isn't that triangulation? The exact same way. They went all the way from the, so the coast of India, all the way across several thousand or so miles to get to the top of Mount Everest through triangulation. It's how they did things back then. They didn't do what just little steps at a time, from one point to another point to another point to another point, and they had to measure that distance accurately, get that angle accurately, and they were very close to the height of Mount Everest. We haven't really improved upon it by much since they did that. Didn't they just lower it by a foot or so? I thought they raised it by a foot, not lower it by a foot. Um, but uh, maybe the mountain it might still be growing. So. <laughs> I guess that's one thing we have to go look up. I think the mountain is still growing. So let's Google it, right? Didn't it go up by one foot? Didn't it used to be 29, 28? I think it went up by about a foot when they remeasured it. Now, was it because the mountain is higher or is it because they had a better measurement? Hard to say.